So we're going to move on to chapter 19, which covers the heart. So the first part of the chapter is going to cover more of the anatomy of the heart. And then towards the end, we cover the physiology side of it. The cardiovascular system is composed of both the heart and the blood vessels. And it's going to be responsible for circulating that blood throughout the body. So the blood circulation is necessary for the exchange of substances. So when I'm talking about substances, I'm talking about nutrients and gases between the blood capillaries and the cells of the body tissue. The term perfusion or blood perfusion refers to the delivery of blood per time per gram of tissue. Um, so how effectively are we delivering blood to all of our cells and tissues? We have to have sufficient perfusion in order to sustain life. If the cells of our bodies are not getting adequate perfusion, that means they're not getting adequate blood delivery, which in turn means they're not getting the oxygen and nutrients that those cells need to survive, and the consequence of that is those cells are going to die. And so depending on which cells we're talking about, it, it can be, you know, life-threatening. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death, both worldwide and the U.S. So let's look at those blood vessels. Blood vessels are often called the soft pipes because they are essentially the pipes that transport the blood throughout the, the cardiovascular system. We've got three types of blood vessels. We have the arteries. The ar arteries are the ones that carry the blood away from the heart. Now most of the time the arteries are carrying oxygenated blood, blood that has oxygen in it. Um, there is a situation where it's carrying deoxygenated blood and that's as the heart is pumping um, blood that has just returned to the heart, it pumps it out towards the lungs. So in that case, the arteries that go between the heart and the lungs carry deoxygenated blood. Other than that, every other artery is carrying oxygenated blood. Veins carry blood back to the heart. So again, these are usually, but not always, deoxygenated. So most of the time, the arteries pump this newly oxygenated blood from the heart out to the body. As it travels through the body, it delivers all that oxygen. So as it's coming back, it doesn't have oxygen. It's deoxygenated on its way back to the heart. So veins typically carry deoxygenated blood back to the heart. Again, there's an exception. And just like we had, it was the same exception for the veins that we had in the arteries. Whenever that deoxygenated blood makes its way back to the heart, the heart is gonna pump it away out to the lungs so in that case, it's going away, so it's using arteries out to the lungs to get oxygen. Now, the blood is going to pick up oxygen when it's in the lungs and carry it back to the heart. So it's in the veins coming back to the heart, but in that case, it's just picked up oxygen. So that's the exception for when the veins are carrying oxygenated blood back to the heart. Every other time, it's going to be deoxygenated. And then you have the capillaries, which are the smallest blood vessels. And again, it's in the capillaries where the exchange occurs um, between blood and the air in the lungs, or if you're talking about the body cells and the body tissues, you're going to exchange oxygen and CO2. So here's our heart, here's our arteries taking blood away from the heart, here's our capillaries. Notice again, the capillaries are going from red to blue because as the blood travels through the capillaries, like this says down here, this is where gas exchange is going to happen. We're going to deliver the oxygen, which is what's making the blood red in this picture, and pick up waste products such as CO2. So it, as we deliver oxygen, the blood loses its red color and becomes blue, and then it goes back into the veins, which carries it back to the heart. The heart is a hollow organ made up of four separate chambers and two pumps. So here's your right side, one chamber, two chambers. Here's your left side, one chamber, two chambers. So there's four chambers. We have the right-sided pump. So this is the whole right side of the heart. The right side of the heart can consist of two chambers, one up here and one down here. The right-sided pump, or the right side of the heart, receives deoxygenated blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs. 
So originally your heart pumps all this oxygenated blood out to the body. As that blood travels through the body, it delivers the oxygen. So it, it kind of loses all of its oxygen. So by the time it's coming back to the heart, it is deoxygenated and it's coming into that right side. Okay, so when the heart contracts, if you can follow this, that blood is going to go up through this vessel and out to the lungs, okay? So we're pumping, which the right side is getting deoxygenated blood and pumping it out to the lungs. Okay. The left side receives oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it to the body. Okay, so start back over here on the right side. We had deoxygenated blood going through the vessel out to the lungs. What's going to happen in the lungs? We breathe, and as we breathe, oxygen comes into our lungs. That oxygen is going to attach to the hemoglobin on the blood in those capillaries, and it's going to oxygenate it. So that oxygenated blood is going to come back to the heart through veins into our left atrium or a left-sided pump, okay? And now the left side is gonna contract, and if you can kind of pass behind this area of the picture right here, you get to this vessel, which is the aorta, and so the left side is gonna pump the oxygenated blood into the aorta, which is then going to travel through the body, okay? So right side is deoxygenated blood that's gonna get pumped to the lungs. Left side is oxygenated blood that's gonna get pumped to the body. So each one of these sides has a receiving chamber and a pumping chamber. The receiving chamber is where the blood is going to come into. The receiving chamber is the atrium here, and that's where the blood first enters that side of the heart. And then the pumping chamber is the ventricle. So right atrium, right ventricle, and then on the left side, it's the same thing. The atrium is the receiving chamber, and then the ventricle is the pumping chamber. The atria, or the receiving chambers, always sit superiorly or on top of the pumping chambers. Atria are on top, ventricles are on the bottom. Now let's describe the blood vessels associated with the heart. These are called the great vessels. So the great vessels are continuous with the chambers. That means they connect to the different chambers of the heart and they transport the blood directly to and from the different chambers. So you've got your pulmonary trunk, which is here. The aorta, which is here. The superior vena cava, which is here and the inferior vena cava, which is here. So let's talk about specifically where each of those are and what they're doing. So the pulmonary trunk is right here. This one receives the deoxygenated from the blood from the right ventricle. So let's kind of put all this together. So here's our right atria, atrium. Here's our right ventricle. See how the right ventricle directly connects with this pulmonary trunk. Um, sometimes you'll see this called the pulmonary artery. The trunk is just kind of like this bottom part, and then as it moves up, it's the artery, but I'm not, you can, I sometimes use those interchangeably. So the pulmonary trunk receives the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle. So where do you think the pulmonary trunk is going to take this blood? It's going to take it out to the lungs, okay? Um, I'm going to skip ahead really quickly and move down here to the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins drain the oxygenated blood into the left atrium. So when the pulmonary trunk take the deoxygenated blood through the pulmonary arteries and out to the lungs, that, lo that blood gets oxygenated and then it comes back through those pulmonary veins. Pulmonary meaning lungs, veins meaning we're coming back to the heart. So it's gonna bring that oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart and take it into the left atrium, okay? The superior and inferior vena cava, here's the superior and here's the inferior. Um, these drain deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. 
So all the blood that's been traveling through the body and it's now deoxygenated because it gave off all of the oxygen while it was traveling, it's going to come back to the heart through the vena cava. So everything above the diaphragm in, enters through the superior vena cava. Everything from below the diaphragm enters through the inferior vena cava. Either way, they both empty directly into the right atrium. And then lastly, the aorta, which is this giant vessel here, this one receives oxygenated blood from the left ventricle. So we had oxygenated blood come into the right, I'm sorry, to the left atrium, and then that dumps into the left ventricle. And when this left ventricle contracts, it's going to push its blood into the aorta. Okay, so the great vessels, they're all directly connected to one of the chambers of the heart. And depending on which one you're talking about, you should know whether it's carrying oxygenated or deoxygenated blood. In addition to the vessels, there are two sets of valves located in the heart. The atrioventricular valves, or AV, um, are located between the atria and the ventricle on each side. So their name kind of tells you where they're at. They're atrioventricular valves. They're located right in between the atrium and the ventricle. Okay, so the right-sided AV valve right here uh, is called the tricuspid valve because it's made up of these little flaps called cusps, and the right side has three of them. So you could call this the... Um, the right AV valve, you could call it the right atrioventricular valve, or you could call it the tricuspid valve. All three of those words describe that same thing. So come over to the left side of the heart, here's the atrium, here's the ventricle, so where's that left AV valve? Right here in between. The left AV valve has two cusps, so it's called the bicuspid valve also sometimes called the mitral valve. So literally this valve right here could be the left atrioventricular valve, the left AV valve, the bicuspid, or the mitral valve. All four of those names refer to this valve right here. Okay, so the atrioventricular valves regulate the passage of the blood from the atrium into the ventricle. We also have semilunar valves. Semilunar valves are located at the boundary of the ventricle and whichever associated arterial trunk goes with it. So if that sounds confusing, let's reflect back. The right ventricle, remember it emptied its blood into that pulmonary trunk. So the semilunar valve on the right side is in between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, right? On the left side, what was the left ventricle associated with? What large vessel it was associated with the aorta? So the semilunar valve on the left side lies in between the left ventricle and the aorta. So the right-sided semilunar valve is called the pulmonary semilunar valve, and the one on the left side is called the aortic semilunar valves. So for all four of these valves, they have one main function, and it is to allow unidirectional flow of the blood, which means we don't want to allow a lot of backflow. So if we get blood coming into the right atrium, and we are going to pump it into the right ventricle, when that ventricle contracts, we don't want half of that blood splashing right back up into the right atrium. It needs to go in the pattern. So if you follow the laser pointer, the blood needs to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle through the pulmonary arteries. Okay, let's pretend we're in the lungs. It's going to go through the lungs. It's going to come in through the pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, and then out through the aorta and spread throughout the body with circulation. And the blood needs to continue in that pattern without going backwards. And so these valves are going to prevent that backward flow of blood. The blood vessels in the pumps of the heart are organized into two main circuits. 
the pulmonary circulation, and the systemic circulation. So I haven't really used the term pulmonary circulation, but I've already kind of described it because I keep talking about when the heart pumps that deoxygenated blood out to the lungs to collect oxygen. Okay, so the pulmonary circulation carries the deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart through the vessels of the lungs where the blood re releases CO2 and picks up oxygen. The CO2 is what the blood has collected when it traveled through the body and it was all the cellular waste product. So whenever the blood comes back to the right side of the heart, it has very little oxygen and it has a lot of CO2. So we're going to use the pulmonary circulation to pump that blood out to the lungs and when it's in the capillaries of the lungs, it gets rid of the CO2 and it picks up oxygen. So as it leaves the capillaries of the lungs, it leaves the pulmonary circulation, you now see red blood because it is now oxygenated blood. So it left from the right side of the heart, it traveled to the lungs, and it's coming in to the left side of the heart. Systemic circulation carries this newly oxygenated blood through the vessels to the cells of the body where it's going to exchange nutrients, gases, and it's going to pick up waste products that's going to bring back to the heart. So we got newly oxygenated, blo newly oxygenated blood, the heart's going to contract, that blood's going to go throughout the arteries, and as it's going throughout the body, it's delivering oxygen and nutrients, it's picking up waste products, and then once we've delivered all the oxygen we can deliver, we're going to come right back to the right side of the heart. So the basic pattern here is that it starts in the right side of the heart, goes to the lungs, goes to the left side of the heart, goes to the systemic circulation, and then it's back at the right side of the heart, and then it's just going to continue that way. In terms of the heart's location, the heart is located just posterior to the sternum, so right behind that breastbone, to the left of the midline of the body. So it's not directly center of the chest, but rather edged off to the left of the midline, situated between the lungs within the mediastinum. The mediastinum is just kind of this centrally located area um, within the thorax. The posterior superior surface makes up the base, while the inferior surface makes up the apex. So the posterior, posterior superior, so the back top of the heart is referred to as the base, and then this is the bottom, and it kind of comes to a point, and this is called the apex. The heart is enclosed by what's called the pericardium. So in 2401, everybody learned about serous membranes, and those are the membranes that line uh, different areas of the body. You've got a visceral, you've got a parietal, and then in between you've got that serous cavity that has serous fluid, and a lot of times that helps just lubricate and prevent friction. So the serous membrane that covers the heart is referred to as the pericardium. The outer layer is the pericardial sac, which has two layers. <clears throat> so the outermost layer is a fibrous layer that attaches superiorly to the base of the great arterial trunks and inferior to the diagram. So you can see that fibrous layer here attaching superiorly to the great arterial trunks. So you, have, you can see it's, our, it's attaching to the aorta, it's attaching to the superior vena cava, it's attaching to the pulmonary arteries, and then inferiorly to the diaphragm. So here's again is that outer fibrous layer. This structure right here that I'm outlining is the diaphragm. So you can see how that outer layer is attaching to the diaphragm. So the point of this layer is to restrict the movement of the heart. Um, so obviously the heart has movement. It's contracting and moving around, but we don't want it certainly bouncing around the thoracic cavity. So this allows it the movement that it needs, but also kind of keeping it attached where it needs to be. Um, it also prevents the heart from overfilling. So we don't want the heart to overfill as blood comes in and stretch it out too much. The innermost layer of the pericardial sac is a very thin serous membrane 
and that is the parietal layer, layer of the serous pericardium. So if you focus on um, what this is telling you in here, um, and also this up here, it kind of shows you the, the direct layers of things. So you've got the pericardial sac, which is the fibrous pericardium, so it's that fibrous layer, and then the parietal layer of the pericardium, so the outside layer of the serous membrane, okay? Uh, continuous with the, uh, this should say parietal right there, continuous with the parietal pericardium is the visceral pericardium, so that's, it's hard to show with this pointer because my pointer is a little bit too fat for that thin line, but the visceral pericardium uh, is just that thin layer. Um, and then between the visceral and the parietal, you've got the um, pericardial cavity, which has the serous fluid. And so that's going to allow kind of this lubricated movement as the heart contracts. One of our clinical views, pericarditis. So pericarditis is a condition defined by the inflammation of the pericardium. Um, anytime you get inflammation, it allows fluid to accumulate in a space where it might normally not otherwise accumulate. We have very tight junctions on these things. And when we get inflammation, those junctions loosen, which means things can leak through or flow through. So in this case, specifically, you get inflammation of the pericardium and then fluid can come into that pericardial cavity and accumulate. So this would be normal. You, there's not a ton of fluid going on in there. Um, and this is if you have inflammation, you get pericardial effusion. So you can see that the fluid is kind of coming in here. So usually pericarditis results from some kind of bacterial or viral infection. Anytime you have an infection, you have you run the chance of getting an inflammatory response. Um, and then again, in, inflam an inflammatory response or inflammation allows permeability or otherwise it allows fluid to come into an area where it normally would be restricted out of. So we have bacterial or viral infection that leads to inflammation that leads to fluid coming into that pericardial cavity. So in severe cases, the accumulation of all of that fluid can start to restrict the heart's movement. So as the heart tries to pump, it can't move and pump the way it's supposed to because all that fluid buildup is there. Um, if the heart starts to pump inadequate amounts of blood, that's, car that's called cardiac tamponade. Um, so that would be, you know, too much fluid buildup here to where the heart cannot move enough to pump sufficient amounts of blood to the body. So you can go in and, and remove some of that fluid to try to uh, reverse that. Some of the different features of the heart. So we talked about how the heart has two chambers. So in this case, it's closed. When we talked about the chambers earlier, we were looking at almost like a dissected open heart. So this is the heart if you're just looking at it from an anterior view and then you can see it's closed, the right atrium would be this right here. Um, and then this would be the right ventricle. You would have to kind of slice it open and then open it like a book to be able to view the left ventricle with here, but you can't really see the whole thing because the right ventricle is so prominent here. Okay, so two uh, smaller atria, two larger ventricles, it contains sulci. Sulci is the plural word for sulcus. Sulcus might sound familiar um, from 2401 when we talked about the different uh, grooves and such in the brain. So a sulcus is a groove, particularly with the heart. Those grooves contain coronary vessels. Um, so you have the coronary sulcus which is right here, it's just this groove or this indentation that goes in between or sort of separates the atria from the ventricle. You, there's also one over here. So this is the right coronar coronary sulcus. This is the left coronary sulcus. Um, it goes around, so it goes around the back side of the heart. So it would start here and then go around the back side of the heart and then pick up 
here. So you can't really see that backside here, but it goes all the way around. So again, in that coronary sulcus, you have coronary vessels. Coronary vessels we'll get to, but those are the blood vessels that specifically deliver oxygen and nutrients to the actual heart tissue itself. And then the veins, of course, drain that tissue. Then you have the interventricular sulcus, which is right here. The interventricular sulcus is a deep groove that separates the ventricles. So this, everything over here is your right ventricle. Everything over here is your left ventricle. And here's that interventricular sulcus between the ventricles. Um, it extends from the coronary sulcus. So here is that left coronary sulcus. Remember, it went from the right all the way around to the back and came up the left. So the interventricular sulcus starts at the level of that coronary sulcus and goes down all the way to the apex of the heart. Again, containing coronary vessels. Anterior view of the heart. So we've got the textbook diagram and then we've got an actual specimen. So this is what it would look like if you're just looking at the anterior aspect or the front view of the heart. Um, just kind of pointing out some of the more noticeable features. So we've got something that's called an oracle. So you've got the right oracle. So here is the atrium. This whole piece here is the atrium. A little flap-like extension off of the atrium is the oracle right here. Um, also visible from this angle, let's see, you can, oh, let me, before I jump ahead, here's the oracle on the actual specimen. Atrium, oracle. Also visible from this angle are the aorta. Here's the aorta here. And here's the aorta here. The pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk. The left oracle from the left ventricle. Wait, that doesn't make sense. The left oracle. Okay, so this should say atrium. So where it says the left oracle from the left ventricle, I don't know if, what I was trying to say there. The oracle is on the atrium. Now certainly you can see the left ventricle. Maybe I meant to say and instead of from. So you can see the left oracle, which is attached to the left atrium. You can see the left ventricle. So again, left oracle, left ventricle. And then the coronary sulcus and the interventricular sulcus. Coronary sulcus here, here's the right one. Here's the left one. Here's the right one. Here's the left one. Interventricular sulcus here. Interventricular sulcus here. So just some standout features that you can see when you're looking at the anterior side of the heart. Turning the heart around, looking at the posterior view of the heart, so now we're looking from the back. Uh, when you're looking at the back, some of the more mo noticeable features are going to be the left ventricle. So you can see much more of the left ventricle when you're looking at it from the back or posterior side. The left atrium is this right here. You can see these vessels. These are the pulmonary veins. This is where uh, the blood that's coming back from the lungs that just got oxygenated Remember, it comes into the left atrium. It's going to come through these pulmonary veins right here. Um, also visible from this angle are the superior and inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. And the pulmonary arteries, which I just pointed out. Pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins. Uh, pulmonary artery pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery, and the veins are hard to see because it looks like they've collapsed in this diagram, but you can kind of see them here, 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 and here. The heart has different layers. So the walls of the ventricles are larger than the walls of the atria because they're the pumping chambers. So let's look at that functionally. 
when the blood comes into the atria and the heart contracts, where does the blood go? All it has to do is go whoop, right in here into the ventricle. It's right there. Almost gravity would help it do that, but it does pump a little. Okay, the, from this ventricle, when the heart contracts, where does the blood go? Well, we're in the right ventricle, so the blood has to go all the way out here. So it's got a further way to pump. So the ventricular wall is going to be thicker than the atrial wall, and you can certainly see that in the diagram. Okay, let's look at the left side. The uh, blood comes in from the lungs, it comes into the left atria. Where does it go from there? It just has to go down to the left ventricle. So again, we don't need a really thick muscular wall for that to happen. Just a small contraction just moves down here. The left ventricle, now this is where it gets tricky. Where does the left ventricle pump the blood to? It pumps it out to the whole body. So when this heart contracts, this uh, chamber has to pump the blood through the aorta, and then from there it's going to con continue out and distribute up throughout the body. So the left ventricle has a lot of work to do. So not only is the ventricle have a thicker wall than the atria, but look at the difference between the left ventricular wall and the right ventricular wall. The left ventricular wall is about three times thicker than that of the right because it's got much more work to do. It has to pump the blood all the way out to the body, whereas the right ventricular wall is just responsible for pumping it out to the lungs. Okay, so yes, the ventricular walls are thicker than the atrial wall, but also the left ventricular wall is about three times thicker than the right ventricular wall because it's got further to pump the blood. So you can see that if you take a cross section or a transverse section of the heart, this would be the right ventricle, this would be the left ventricle, and you can see the thickness of the ventricular wall on the right compared to the thickness of the ventricular wall on the left, it's much thicker in the left. Um, you should notice that as well when you get to your sheet heart dissection. Uh, you should be able to see that the left ventricular wall is thicker than the right. There's three distinctive layers of the heart wall. You have the epicardium, which is the outermost layer. The epicardium is the same thing as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So here we, we've got the heart wall. They're taking a cut out and zooming it out. This is the epicardium. So again, it, this is just another term for the uh, visceral layer of the serous pericardium. As you move further in, you get to the myocardium. The myocardium is the thick middle muscular layer. It's made up of cardiac muscle tissue. Um, it's the contraction of this layer that generates the force necessary to pump the blood out of the chamber. And then you have the endocardium here. The endocardium lines the internal surface of the heart and it also lines the external surface of the valves. So you would find it lining this surface and then lining the surface of the valves. A little more detail on the heart chambers. You have the interatrial septum and the interventricular septum. These are thin walls separating the atria and the ventricles respectively. So the interatrial septum, I mean, it looks like they're just pointing to the atrial wall, but it's basically the part of the atrial wall that separates the right from the left atria. Interventricular septum right here, still again, part of the ventricular wall, but separating the right from the left ventricles. So looking at some of the characteristics of the right atrium, looking in here, it's mostly smooth surface. Uh, but it does exhibit pectinate muscles, which are these little ridges that you'd find in here that I'm circling, pectinate muscles. Um, and then you've got the fossa ovalis, that is this circular structure, it's like a depression right there. It occupies what used to be the fetal foramen ovale, so there used to be a hole here that shunted blood directly from the right atrium to the left atrium because the lungs and the fetus aren't functioning properly, so the blood just kind of shunted from one atria to the next. Obviously, 
um, after birth, that needs to close because then we're going to go through our normal pattern once the lungs are functioning. So that's the uh, fossa ovalis. Looking in the right ventricle, you've got um, trabecula carne, which are these um, kind of irregularly shaped muscle ridges. I always think they look like flames a little bit. You find the trabecula carne in the um, in the ventricles. And then you've got papillary muscles, which are these little things that are sticking up. There, there, there. Papillary muscles are these cone-shaped muscles that attach the inner wall to what's called the chordae tendinae. The chordae tendinae are these little strings right here. So you've got your valve. This is your tricuspid valve or your right AV valve. Attached to the valves are these strings. These are called chordae tendinae. And the chordae tendinae also attach to these papillary muscles down here. Um, and so the attachment of the chordae tendinae to the papillary muscles basically makes sure that the flaps of the valve are not going to flap back up into the atria. It kind of, they, they go straight. When the heart contracts, they fold down to allow the blood to come in. And then when the heart relaxes, they go back to straight. They don't go up into the atrium because you've got this connection right here between the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles. The chordae tendinae look very fine and they almost look like they'd be weak, but they're actually pretty strong to hold that attachment. And you should definitely be able to see those uh, in your sheep heart dissection when you get to that. Left atrium also has pectinate muscles um, in the auricle, uh, separated from the left ventricle, of course, by the left AV valve or the bicuspid or the mitral valve. Left ventricle also has that trabecula carne that we saw in the right ventricle, and then you've got two papillary muscles. Here's one, here's two, again attached to the chordae tendinae of the mitral valve. So again, the heart valves ensure that the blood proceeds in only one direction. You need directional blood flow. We need the blood to come in, go through the right atrium, right AV valve, right ventricle, pulmonary semilunar valve, pulmonary arteries, lungs, pulmonary veins, left atrium, left AV valve or mitral valve, left ventricle, aortic semilunar valve, and then through the aorta. And it needs to go in that direction. Um, each valve consists of connective tissue flaps, which are lined by a la layer of epithelial cells, and we call those flaps cusps. That's where we get the bicuspid and the tricuspid. We've got the two categories of the valves. We have the atrioventricular valves here and here. Here you can really see the tricuspid, one, two, three, versus the bicuspid, one, two. And then we've got the semilunar valves, aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves. For the atrioventricular valves, the right AV valve covers the right atrioventricular opening, so it separates the right atrium through the, from the right ventricle, and it's got three cusps, one, two, three, so it's called the tricuspid. The left AV valve covers the opening from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and it's got one cusp, two cusps. So it's two cusps total. So it's called the bicuspid, also called the mitral valves. Whenever the valves are open, the cusps extend into the ventricles. So here's our atria. So you can see uh, when the atria contract, it forces that valve open and they extend downward into the ventricles. Now during ventricular contraction, when that ventricle contracts, uh, the force of the blood moving upwards is going to cause these valves to close. So when this closes, it blocks off the entry to the atria. So when the ventricle contracts, this closes and the blood cannot go up into the atria. So the only other available place for it to go would be through one of those semilunar valves. So if we are uh, talking about the right atrium, or, or I'm sorry, the right ventricle, when it contracts, 
the right atria becomes closed off by this valve and then it has to go through that pulmonary semilunar valve to get out into the lungs. So again, the valve does not move up so far that it goes into the atria because it's attached to the papillary muscles through these chordae tendinae. So I will try to find a good video that shows you the movement of all these parts and pieces so you can kind of visualize it and actually see what's going on. The semilunar valves are located between the ventricle and then the associated arterial trunk. So if we're talking about the right side, we're talking about the pulmonary semilunar valve. If we're talking about the left side, we're talking about the aortic semilunar valve. They're both composed of three half moon shapes, so that's where we get the term semilunar cusps, and in this case the cusps are not attached to any chordae tendinae. So these valves open in response to ventricular contraction, so when that ventricle contracts it forces the blood upwards and that kind of swings the valves open almost like doors on a saloon or something like that. Um, so it opens it and then the blood can go into that arterial trunk. Whenever the ventricle relaxes, the pressure in the ventricle goes down and then that br then brings the uh, cusps down and so they end up closing. Now just due to gravity alone, some of the blood that got pushed up is going to fall back down, but because the valve is closed, it will stay here at the bottom of the arterial trunk until the next contraction, meaning it's not going to flow all the way back down to get back into the ventricle. So this is just a summary of the different valves. We've got the right AV, left AV, pulmonary semilunar, aortic semilunar. Uh, this should be able to be found in your book. Um, this is an older version, so I don't know what uh, page or anything. Um, tell you where they're found, what their structure is, and uh, kind of how they prevent backflow. The myocardium, or the muscle layer of the heart, is made up of cardiac muscle tissue. There are some specific definitions that kind of go along with uh, cardiac muscle. So the first one is sarcolemma. Sarcolemma is simply the plasma membrane um, of the cardiac muscle tissue. It contains something called transverse tubules, or T-tubules that extend down into what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcolemma is basically just, it's the plasma membrane of the cardiac muscle, but it's a little bit specialized because it's got a specialized function um, to where it contains these T-tubules. Um, the T-tubules, you will notice these little dots, so I'm kind of circling around the dot, dot right there. That's where the, um, so this clear membrane would be the sarcolemma, and then at certain points the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane dives down into the muscle fiber itself. And so it looks just like a dot, but basically it's kind of like a uh, like a well or a tunnel where it's diving down into the muscle tissue itself, and that's the T-tubule. Okay, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so this kind of sounds like endoplasmic reticulum, which we uh, learned in 2401 as just a regular cellular organelle. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a very similar structure and again just specialized for the muscle tissue. Its main job is to store calcium. So anytime you hear sarcoplasmic reticulum, you should think of calcium storage. So it's a calcium storing net-like structure uh, that surrounds the bundles of myofilaments that are called myofibrils. So we'll look at, um, we'll look at that here in a bit too. Okay, so like skeletal muscles, the myofilaments are arranged into sarcomeres, so they have that striated appearance under the microscope. So if you remember, skeletal muscle had striations, cardiac muscle also has striations because it's organized into sarcomeres, uh, but smooth muscle does not. Those are three different types of muscles. So looking at some of the intracellular structures that you see in cardiac muscle cells, the neighbors, neighboring cells have this extensively folded sarcolemma. So you can see this um, folding right here. 
This helps to uh, increase their stability, so they're more likely to stay next to each other. Staying next to each other is absolutely essential for their function because they're going to communicate in a very direct manner from one cell to the next. So they have to kind of maintain their structural stability. Um, and then it's going to facilitate that communication between the cardiac muscle cells because then when uh, you have this folding, we can put more of these uh, cellular structures, these desmosomes and gap junctions, and those work to enhance the communication. So unique to cardiac muscle tissue are something called intercalated discs. Intercalated discs um, link the cardiac cells both mechanically and electrically. Um, so there's two kind of proteins that make up intercalated discs, desmosomes and gap junctions. So I said that the intercalated discs um, help link them physically or mechanically. That's kind of how the desmosomes work. If you look at it, it's the purple things right here. I always think of these like staples. You, it kind of attaches to one side, attaches to the other, and it holds them together mechanically. This al allows them to kind of contract and relax together kind of as a whole unit, even though they're separate cells. Um, the other one is gap junctions. So this is kind of a different view. A gap junction is kind of like a half of a tunnel. So if one cell has a half of a tunnel and the next cell has a half of a tunnel and then you put those two together, it makes one continuous tunnel. And that's how it helps the electrical impulses to travel faster. So unlike in, um, if you're talking about like neuronal communication, you have neurotransmitters that can get released out of one cell and travel across to the next cell. When we're talking about cardiac muscle, there's a direct communication. There's no extra molecule that travels from one to the other. It's a direct electrical impulse that moves directly from this cell to this cell, to the next cell, to the next cell. So they need to have a physical connection. And so these uh, desmosomes help to keep them close. And the gap junctions provide that direct tunnel so the electrical impulse can just simply move from one cell into the other. Okay, so the gap junctions allow um, what's called functional syncytium that allows the chamber to contract as a unit because each heart chamber is made up of, you know, a bunch of different cells. We can't have all of those cells contracting at a different time. We need the chamber to contract as one functional unit. That's functional syncytium. And the gap junctions allow that to happen because the electrical impulse can travel throughout the cells of that chamber very rapidly. Looking at the metabolism of cardiac muscle, Cardiac muscle has a huge demand for energy. It relies almost exclusively on aerobic cellular respiration for the generation of ATP, um, and as such, it has an extensive blood supply because we've got to bring it all of the nutrients and the oxygen and numerous mitochondria to support those energy demands. So just for comparison purposes, the mitochondria make up about 25% of cardiac cell volume as opposed to only, as opposed to only 2% of skeletal muscle. So looking at skeletal muscle, you have about 2% mitochondria per volume in the cell and 25% uh, when you're looking at cardiac muscle cells. So because of the reliance on aerobic respiration, the cardiac tissue is highly susceptible to failure if, if ischemia presents. Ischemia is when you have low oxygen condition. So anything that impairs the blood flow to the heart, such as narrowing of those coronary arteries, which are the vessels that bring the oxygen to the heart, it can cause damage or death. When you hear about the fibrous skeleton of the heart, we're talking about this dense irregular connective tissue that kind of goes around the heart. It, it provides structural support at the boundary of the atria and ventricles to just kind of help support the different uh, chambers and valves, helps to anchor those valves there, and provides a rigid framework for which the cardiac, cardiac muscle can attach. So it's basically just fibrous support and attachment points. However, it also acts as an electrical insulator. 
because it doesn't connect to the action potentials, because it's that fibrous connective tissue as opposed to the cardiac muscle tissue, it can prevent the atria from contracting at the same time as the ventricles. So when we get into the physiology of how the heart contracts, the atria contract first and then the ventricles contract and they kind of alternate that pattern. Um, so you've got this fibrous skeleton. So if you look at, it's kind of a little bit of a weird image um, here, you can see where we're looking. Here's the heart. We're kind of taking this oblique transverse section here. So if you were to cut it like this and then look upon it like this, you can see the fibrous connective tissue, the fibrous skeleton. So again, it's kind of anchoring and supporting the valves and the chambers, but also acting as an electrical insulator because through all this myocardium, you've got all that electrical activity as the heart um, conducts action potentials and contracts, um, but that electrical uh, activity is not conducted through the fibrous skeleton. So again, that can prevent the atria from contracting at the same time as the ventricles. The cardiac muscle cells are kind of arranged in like a spiral type of pattern around the chambers of the heart that are again attached to that fibrous skeleton. So here's the atria, they would be up here, they're always the superior chambers. When the atria contract, it squeezes inwards. So this would squeeze in this direction, and this would squeeze in this direction. So they squeeze inwards towards each other, and the effect of that is that the blood get, gets pushed down into the ventricles. So the atrial contraction narrows the heart because it squeezes inwards. And again, that pushes the blood down. It pushes the blood into the ventricles, which is a downward motion. Now, when the vent ventricles start to contract, it starts at the apex, which is the pointed region, and it moves superiorly or upwards. So when the ventricle contracts, you're going to have the muscle moving up and up this way. So ventricular contraction shortens the heart. So atrial narrowed it because we squeezed inward. Ventricle shortens because we're squeezing upwards. And as we squeeze upwards, it moves the blood up so that it can exit through the different arterial trunks, the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. Even though the heart constantly has blood throughout its different chambers, it can't use that blood as its source of oxygen and nutrients. It can't absorb the oxygen and nutrients from the blood that's held within the chambers and pumped from the chambers. So instead, we have to provide the heart with its own blood supply, its own distribution, and that's our coronary circulation. So you can kind of see this here, all of this that you're looking at here represents the different blood vessels that kind of lie on the outside of the heart tissue to supply oxygen and nutrients to the heart tissue itself. So the coronary arteries transport oxygenated blood again to the heart wall and then the coronary veins transport deoxygenated blood away from the heart wall. Right and left coronary arteries travel through the coronary sulcus. So we talked about that when we looked at the anatomy of the heart. Here's the right coronary sulcus. It goes around the posterior aspect and comes over to the left side of the heart. Um, then the right coronary sulcus, you have the right coronary artery, which is right here. And it branches off into the right marginal artery, which comes down the right border of the heart, supplies that area. And then the posterior interventricular artery. So if I continued around, and so now I'm at the back side of the heart. So this right here is showing you the back side of the heart. This is the posterior interventricular artery. So the name kind of tells you where it's at. Posterior tells you it's on the back. Interventricular tells you it's lying in between the right and the left ventricles. Okay, so that, that artery is going to supply the left and right ventricles. The left coronary artery, which you can see right here, branches off into the circumflex artery, which goes and supplies the left atrium and ventricle. So it goes down kind of the left side. And then the anterior interventricular artery. So 
right down here. So front side, anterior, interventricular, in between the right and the left ventricles. Okay. So it's going to supply most of the anterior surface of uh, both of the ventricles and then that interventricular septum, which was that piece of tissue that actually divides the two ventricles. Worth noting, the anterior interventricular artery, this one right here, is also known as the widow maker because an occlusion of this artery is likely to cause a fatal heart attack very rapidly, making somebody's spouse a widow because it supplies so much of the ventricles and the ventricles are what are responsible for pumping the blood out to the rest of the body. If we get an occlusion here, what that means is occlusion means a blockage. If we get a blockage, blood distribution doesn't make it to the majority of the ventricles, which means they don't get the oxygen and the nutrients they need to produce the energy to contract. So once they start contracting, you can have a, a fatal heart attack. Just like the coronary arteries were the vessels that were responsible for supplying the blood to the heart, the coronary veins are going to be the vessels responsible for draining the blood from the heart. So these are going to take away um, the blood carrying all of the waste products from the uh, cardiac muscle tissue and uh, empty it back into the right atrium. So you have the great cardiac vein. You can see that here, kind of on the anterior surface of the heart lies in that anterior interventricular sulcus. The middle cardiac vein is here. It lies within the posterior interventricular sulcus. And then the small cardiac vein travels along the right side of the heart, kind of next to, next to the right marginal artery. So all of these uh, veins are gonna drain into the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus allows the blood to go directly into the right atrium because remember when we talked about our systemic circulation, all of the deoxygenated blood that had been traveling through the body drained into the right atrium of the heart. It's the same for this blood. This is deoxygenated blood. It's also going to drain into the right atrium of the heart, but it's going to do so through the coronary sulcus, I'm sorry, through the coronary sinus, my apologies. Um, whereas when we're talking about systemic, it drained into the right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava. For the uh, coronary veins, it drains into the right atrium through the coronary sinus. Clinical view, angina pectoris. Angina pectoris is characterized by poorly localized pain sensation. So you feel the pain, you can't necessarily pinpoint exactly where it's at. Um, towards the left side of the chest, maybe the left arm, and sometimes in the jaw or even the back. This is caused by the narrowing of coronary arteries. Um, so those coronary arteries that are supplying the blood to the heart, if they start to narrow, it can cause this pain associated with angina pectoris. Um, reasons why they might be narrowing could be something called atherosclerosis or otherwise it could be caused by a coronary spasm. So atherosclerosis is the narrowing of the coronary arteries due to plaque buildup. So this is like kind of a high cholesterol situation. If you have high cholesterol and you start to get some plaque buildup, so you can see that here, the yellow stuff in here is the plaque. And as it builds up along the walls of those vessels, it reduces the free open space through which blood can travel. So it causes a narrowing of the space in the vessel that blood has to travel. It could also be caused by a coronary spasm, which is just a sudden narrowing of the vessels caused by smooth muscle contraction. So our blood vessels have small amounts of smooth muscle that surround them. And when that smooth muscle contracts, it basically closes off or narrows the vessels that are kind of within that smooth muscle. Um, and then when that muscle relaxes, it opens them up. So if we get that smooth muscle contraction around our coronary arteries, we get coronary spasms. So the vessels just kind of uh, narrow and again, reduce the amount of blood that can go through there. Um, so note that these two bullet points down here are associated 
specifically with coronary spasm. These don't apply to atherosclerosis, but rather just to coronary spasm. Um, generally occurs after strenuous exercise. So after strenuous exercise, you could potentially get coronary spasm. Um, and it goes away on, on its own. It can go away on its own, or if it doesn't, you can use vasodilators such as nitroglycerin. So those are chemicals um, that naturally cause those uh, smooth muscle to relax and the blood vessel to reopen. Another clinical view is myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is otherwise known as a heart attack. It's a potentially lethal condition that occurs when you have a sudden and complete occlusion of an artery. So all of a sudden there is a 100% blockage in one of those coronary arteries and think about what those coronary arteries do. They are responsible for delivering blood, which carries oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle itself. If all of a sudden you have a complete blockage of that, then you're gonna have an area of the heart that stops receiving blood, meaning it's not gonna get any oxygen, it's not gonna get any nutrients, and if it doesn't get those things, then it cannot do its job. So it's not gonna be able to um, contract the way it's supposed to contract because of that blockage. So it leaves part of the myocardium deoxygenated and at that point the tissue will die. Signs and symptoms, crushing pain in the chest, left arm and black, back. Women may experience fatigue or flu-like symptoms. You get weakness, you get shortness of breath, and then nausea and vomiting. So because myocardial cells do not have significant regeneration capacity, this can be fatal depending on how much of that myocardial tissue has been lost. So our myocardium is not one of our tissues that um, as the cells start to die, they can just freely repair themselves. Even if we restore, if we undo that blockage and we reperfuse with blood, they're not very willing to say, oh, okay, we have blood, let's, let's get better. Um, minus that blood and oxygen, they're going to die and they're going to stay dead. And so that's why it can be um, fatal because we could lose a significant amount of our myocardial tissue. Starting from this slide, we're going to talk about some of the um, physiology of the heart. So how the heart actually contracts, the electrical activity that's involved in heart contraction. So specifically in this slide, we're gonna be looking at some of the anatomic structures that are responsible for controlling heart activity. So we know that the heart continuously pumps and it does so in a rhythmic pattern. Um, and that requires these electrical events that get started in one area of the heart and then they get transmitted throughout the remainder of the heart. Um, so we have what's called a pacemaker in our heart, um, our natural pacemaker. We've all heard of artificial pacemakers, and we can insert those into the heart when our natural pacemaker doesn't work. But our natural pacemaker is a specialized area of the heart that initiates the electrical events needed to start uh, the pathway so that we get a, a contraction of the heart. And then those electrical activities continue throughout these conduction fibers to the heart and it makes sure that one, both the atria and the ventricles both contract and two, that they don't contract at the same time. We need the atria to contract first so that we can move the blood from the atria to the ventricle before the ventricle contracts. So the uh, the natural pacemaker of the heart is called the sinoatrial node or the SA node. The SA node is located in the posterior wall of the right atrium and this is where the heartbeat is going to be initiated. The electrical events for the heartbeat are going to start in the SA node and again this is our natural pacemaker. The atrioventricular node or AV node, you would see that one right here. This one's located in the floor of the right atrium between the AV valve in the coronary sinus opening. You can't really see the coronary sinus opening here in this diagram, but that's where the AV valve is located. Then you have the atrioventricular or AV bundle of His, which extends from the AV node through the interventricular septum and then divides into left and right bundles as you get to the apex of the heart. 
So it starts at the AV node, and it goes down the interventricular septum as, as you approach the, oops, I lost my pointer. It starts at the AV node, goes down the interventricular septum, and as you get towards the apex of the heart, it splits into a left and a right bundle. So those are your AV bundle of his. Then you have what's called Purkinje fibers. Purkinje fibers extend from the left and right bundles from the apex through the ventricles. So after we kind of make a turn to say the right bundle, you have these projections that are going into the like ventricular tissue here. Those are your Purkinje fibers. So you have them on the side as well. So we start at the SA node and then our electrical activity is going to pass from the SA node to the AV node, down the bundle of his, and then either left or right into the Purkinje fibers. And so that, that's how our electrical activity can travel from the start all the way to the finish and lead to a contraction of the atrial wall and then later a contraction of the ventricular wall. For the innervation of the heart, and when I say innervation of the heart, I'm referring to how the nervous center communicates and regulates the heart rate. We have the cardiac center within the medulla oblongata of the brain. It houses, houses a cardioacceleratory and a cardioinhibitory center. It's important to note that the heartbeat is not initiated from these centers because, again, the heartbeat is initiated from the SA node of the heart. But cardiac activity can be modulated from these centers of the brain. The heart is innervated by both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. So parasympathetic is your rest and digest. Sympathetic is your fight or flight. Which of those two systems do you think is going to cause an increase in heart rate? It would be the sympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system gets activated. You're in fight or flight mode. Your heart rate's going to increase. So let's look at, start with parasympathetic innervation. So this is rest and digest. The innervation is going to come from the cardioinhibitory center through the vagus nerves. The nerves are going to start to descend from the brain into the thoracic cavity and branch off to supply the heart. You've got the right vagus nerve that innervates the SA node. The left vagus nerve is going to go and innervate the AV node. And the ultimate effect is you're going to get a decrease in heart rate. Note that there's no effect on the force of contraction. We're only innervating those nodes, and those nodes regulate the electrical activity, so they're going to regulate how quickly or how slowly the heart beats. So parasympathetic comes from cardioinhibitory. The nervous signal travels from the brain to the heart through the vagus nerve. Right vagus goes to SA, left vagus goes to AV, and ultimately it's going to decrease the rate of contraction. Sympathetic innervation, this is your fight or flight. Innervation comes from the cardioacceleratory center in the brain. Neurons from the upper thoracic region of the spinal cord are going to extend to the AV node, the SA node, and the myocardium. So this one is specifically going to increase both the heart rate and the force of contraction. We can we can increase the heart rate because we're communicating with the a SA and AV node, but we can increase the force of contraction because we're communicating directly with the myocardium, directly with that muscle tissue. So we get both increase in rate and force of contraction. It also innervates the coronary arteries, causing vasodilation. What's going to happen if we vasodilate those coronary arteries, or the arteries that are bringing blood and oxygen to the um, myocardium? Well, it ultimately increases the amount of oxygen delivery, which is going to be necessary because now we're beating at a faster rate and with a stronger contractile force. So we need more oxygen so that we can create more energy to support those increased needs. There's something called the atrial reflex. It's also called the Bain Bridge reflex. The main goal of this reflex is to prevent the heart from overfilling. So we have baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are receptors specifically that detect stretch or distension. We have baroreceptors in the atrial wall. 
and those get stimulated when you have an increased amount in venous return. So if we're just like kind of going steady, we've got a certain amount of blood coming back to the atrium from our veins, and for whatever reason, we start to get an increased amount in blood coming back to the atrium from those veins, what's gonna happen is gonna stretch that atrial wall. And when it stretches that atrial wall, um, the baroreceptors become activated and they send signals along the sensory neurons to the cardioaccelerotory center in the brain. So stretching here, we're gonna send signals up to the cardioaccelerotory center in the brain. That's gonna then cause signals to be sent back down through sympathetic neurons to the heart causing an increase in the rate in which the blood's going to move. So increase in the heart rate so that we can pump the heart faster and pump some of that blood out of the heart faster. If we don't do that, we'll just continue to get more and more venous return in the atria and it will stretch and stretch and stretch and that's not a good thing. So if our venous return increases, so we're getting more blood back to the atrium through the veins and our atria starts to stretch because it's kind of overfilling at this point, then it sends signals to the brain, to the cardioaccelerotory center, that it's stretching. The cardioaccelerotory center then sends signals back down to the heart to increase the rate of contraction. So then it starts contracting faster so we can pump that blood through the heart and get it out faster. This slide is in here not necessarily because I need you to memorize all the little details in here, but I really want to point out before we get into it, we're going to be talking about action potentials, um, and we're going to be talking about two different types of action potentials. One of them is going to occur in the nodal system or the conduction system, and it's going to specifically refer to the action potentials that are traveling from the SA node to the AV node to the bundle of His and the Purkinje fibers. So we'll have a conduction system action potential, and then we're gonna talk about another one that happens within the actual cardiac muscle cells. Um, and so it's very important to keep, when we get there, the distinct characteristics of the action potentials differentiated and understand when you're talking about an action potential in the cardiac muscle versus in the nodal system. This is in here to just kind of give you an overview of the pumps and channels. Um, again, I don't really necessarily need you to know all the details of all of this, but if you start to get confused about what is happening during these action potentials, going back to this might kind of um, refresh your memory on how everything works. So the nodal cells and the SA node, again, these are the pacemaker cells that initiate the heartbeat. They're able to generate the action potential, so they have properties that are very similar to um, a neuron. So nodal cells have the following, sodium potassium pumps, sodium leak channels, and potassium leak channels. Sodium potassium pumps are constantly pumping sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. So why doesn't sodium just build up outside and potassium just be, build up inside? That's because we have leak channels. Leak channels allow those ions to move back the opposite direction due to a natural flow. So sodium leak channels allow sodium to kind of leak back into the cell. The potassium leak channels allow potassium to kind of leak back out of the cell. So these are all involved with the maintenance of a resting membrane potential of about negative 60 millivolts. Again, where the concentration of sodium is higher outside of the cell and the concentration of potassium is higher inside of the cell. So based on having all of these channels and pumps there, generally the um, inside of the membrane here is going to be negative 60 millivolts um, in those nodal cells. Then you've got calcium ion pumps to maintain, maintain calcium concentration higher outside of the cell. And then you've got for channels, slow, vo slow voltage um, sodium channels that open in response to um, change in membrane potential or change in the electrical charge, fast voltage potassium channels, and voltage gated potassium channels. When, when it says voltage based, it's, it just means that it's, it opens in response to um, changes in the electrical activity. So as an action potential is traveling through and we're getting changes of that electrical 
potential in the membrane, it would open up these channels. So for the electrical events that are happening in your SA node, so your SA nodal cells have something that's called autorhythmicity. So this is a unique characteristic. It means that they fire action potentials without an external stimulus. If you look at like our neurons, they only fire an action potential when something stimulates them to do so. But that's not the case in our nodal cells. The nodal cells have that autorhythmicity, so they can fire off action potentials without an additional external stimulus. When they do fire an action potential, it relies on the following series of events. Okay, so again, here's our nodal cell. Resting membrane potential, meaning the charge on the inside of the membrane, is about negative 60 millivolts. So reach, we reach throat, we, sorry, we reach threshold through slow voltage gated sodium channels. So the slow voltage gated sodium channels open and sodium comes in. Because remember the sodium potassium pumps are pumping sodium out, keeping it high on the outside. So when the slow voltage gated uh, sodium channels open, uh, here's our inside of our cell, here's our outside of the cell, sodium will slowly come in. So sodium is a positive charge, so as it starts to slowly move into the cell, you see that membrane potential go up. It's going from negative 60 to negative 50 to negative 40. So negative 40 is about what we call threshold in these cells. So slow voltage sodium channels open and sodium comes in and that raises that membrane potential to threshold. So about negative 40 millivolts, uh, that's our threshold, you get um, depolarization, you get fast voltage gated calcium channels open. So when you see, see how the slope of this line is very slow and then it rushes up really fast? What's happening right here is that fast voltage gated calcium channels are opening and calcium is flooding into the cell. So again, here's our calcium channel. It's also going from the outside to the end. So now you have more positive charge coming into the cell. So it goes up really quickly. Um, and then the fast voltage calcium channels are gonna close. So about this point, they've closed. So no more calcium is coming into the cell. So it's not gonna continue to rise up and up and up because we don't have any more positive ions coming into the cell. Um, but voltage gated potassium channels are going to open. Now remember that potassium was high on the inside of the cell. So when their channels open, where's potassium gonna go? It's gonna go out. So you can see that over here, potassium is moving out. So now you have positively charged ion leaving the cell. And so the membrane potential is going to go back down. So voltage, voltage potassium channels open, allowing calcium, I'm sorry, allowing potassium to outflow and then you eventually reestablish your membrane potential at negative 60. And then the same thing happens. Sodium comes in, slowly increases it to threshold. Calcium comes in, calcium channels close, potassium channels open, letting potassium out. So if you need like an easy kind of visual for this diagram, I would go in and write sodium in right here. Sodium in, that's what's happening at this part. Sodium's coming in. Calcium in, right here. That's what's going on here is calcium in. And then potassium out, because that's what's going on right here. So certainly know kind of the details and everything, but that gives you a good visual of when we're talking about the actions of sodium, when we're talking about the actions of calcium, and when we're talking about the actions of potassium. This again, I don't need you to know all the details specifically. It's just kind of showing you how everything spreads and I've kind of mentioned it. This is just more of a visual. It's gonna go from the SA node and spread throughout the atrium to the AV node. So you can see here it's spread throughout the atrial walls to the AV node. And then it's gonna spread down the bundle of His. So you can see these arrows pointing, showing you the electrical conduction is going down the bundle of His. And then from there, it's gonna split into the left and right bundles and the Purkinje fibers, which you can see here. And because the Purkinje fibers extend into the muscle wall of the ventricles, 
you get spread of that action potential throughout the ventricle and then it eventually will lead the ventricles to contract. Another clinical view looking at an ectopic pacemaker. Um, the SA node is our normal pacemaker, the natural pacemaker for the heart. Normally it leads to a heart rhythm of roughly 75 beats per minute. Um, if our SA node were to malfunction, our AV node also has pacemaker abilities. So SA node again would be up here, um, would cause a heart rate of roughly 75 beats per minute. If something goes wrong, our AV node, which is located down here, um, does have pacemaker abilities. It's a slower rate. It would cause a heart rate of 40 to 50 beats per minute. So, but even though it's slower, its rhythm would still be enough to maintain proper blood flow. So we still could survive with that AV node. Now, if both the SA node and AV node malfunction, the cardiac muscle itself has pacemaker abilities, but it would cause a heart rate of 20 to 40 beats per minute, which that would be too slow to allow, perficient, uh, to allow sufficient blood perfusion to our body. So we couldn't really survive off just the pacemaker ability of our cardiac muscle cells. So at that point, you would have to go in and have an ectopic pacemaker put in and so that you could maintain uh, that normal uh, heart rhythm. Cardiac arrhythmia, so we have got different kind of cardiac arrhythmias that happens when there's a disruption in the rate, the regularity, or the sequence of the cardiac cycle. So one of the types is atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is when the atria try to contract 200 to 400 times per minute. This could persist for many years, or it could just degenerate into something called atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, the action potentials become a little bit more chaotic, uh, leads to a regular heart rate, and can lead to a serious disturbance in the heart rhythm. Premature ventricular contractions, or PVCs, these result from stress stimulants or sleep deprivation. You get abnormal action potentials in the AV node or the ventricles. Um, and it's basically where the ventricles are trying to contract too early. Um, these can actually feel very bad, but uh, are not really detrimental unless they occur in repetitively in really large numbers. And then ventricular fibrillation is the one that's really your main life-threatening arrhythmia, it's caused by rapid, repetitious movement of the ventricular muscle. So the contractions are not coordinated and the heart's unable to pump. So you can think of it as like your ventricles trying to contract a lot repetitively, but the way that our cardiac cycle is such, we need the atria to contract so that it can dump its blood into the ventricles so that the ventricles can contract and pump the blood where it needs to go. If the ventricle is just trying to constantly contract without actually receiving any blood from the atria, then we have no blood to pump throughout the body. Um, so this one can cause cardiac arrest unless somebody is able to get a shock to synchronize the elect electrical activity and get those ventricles back on track. So this is the other action potential that I said we were going to talk about. Electrical events in the cardiac muscle cells. Um, so I would use this graph and these are a very clear definition of what's happening. So note the difference in resting membrane potential. When we talked about the nodal cells, it was negative 60 millivolts. We're talking about the cardiac muscle cells, it's negative 90 millivolts. So you'll see this very steep and rapid increase or depolarization. Remember, depolarization is when we're going towards zero. Um, so we're starting at negative 90, we're going towards zero, we're actually passing zero and going up to about positive 30. What's happening here is you have fast voltage gated sodium channels that are opening and sodium is rapidly entering the cell. <clears throat> so we have that positively charged ion just flooding into the cells, and so that's why it's going negative 90, 80, 70, 60, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0, positive 10, 20, all the way up to 30. Um, then you have step two. Voltage-gated potassium channels open, and potassium starts to flood out. 
Okay, so what you would expect to happen if that was the only thing happening is that it would do something like this. It would just come back down like this. But that's not what's happening. It has this weird curvy thing. We call this a plateau. So what's causing the plateau is that at the same time that potassium is open so that potassium is leaving the cell, you also have slow voltage gated calcium channels open so calcium is coming in. So you do have some positive charge that's leaving, but you also have some positive charge that's coming in. That's why it's not a rapid decline. It's kind of this slow plateau looking structure. Um, and then eventually those voltage gated calcium channels will close. And so about this time we have closing of the calcium channels. So calcium is no longer coming in but the potassium stays open. So now you're losing potassium and then you get back to resting membrane potential. So again, we wanna note that the resting membrane potential is negative 90 in the cardiac muscle cells. And um, it's the entry of calcium in step two, which allows muscle contraction. If you remember from um, muscle in 2401, we had to have the entry of calcium into the muscle fibers uh, or into the muscle cells for it to contract. So that entry of calcium that's happening in the plateau phase is what's going to allow the muscles to contract. So again, if you wanted to do the same thing I suggested for the nodal cells, you would say sodium in, and you might even put sodium in fast right here, sodium in fast. Here, it would be potassium out, but also calcium in. So potassium out, calcium in, and that's what leads to the plateau, and maybe even make a note that that's the calcium that's gonna allow for muscle contraction. And then here, it's just potassium out. An electrocardiogram or an ECG or an EKG is a way that we can monitor and assess these electrical activities that are going on in the heart using electrodes. So it kind of makes this composite tracing of all the different action potentials. So let's look at some of them. You've got your P wave. You see the P wave here. This reflects the electrical changes during atrial depolarization happening in the SA node. Then you have this QRS, this big segment right here. This reflects the electrical changes associated with ventricular depolarization. So the ventr ventricles are much larger than the atria, so you would expect this much larger response here. The atria is simultaneously repolarized. So remember how every time we depolarize, then after that we have to repolarize because we leave our resting membrane potential and when we repolarize, that's coming back to that resting membrane potential. So you, there's a atrial repolarization happening in here, but you can't see it on the tracing because this QRS complex is so big, it kind of masks it. Then you have your T waves, which are the electrical change associated with ventricular repolarization. And we have two different segments, the PQ segment. This is associated with atrial plateau, um, and this is where the atria contract. And then the ST segment is when the ventricles contract. So you have the atria depolarize, so that's like the electrical side, atrial depolarization, atria contract. Ventricle depolarization, again an electrical event, ventricles contract, that's a physical event. And then the ventricles repolarize. Electrical event, atria depolarize, physical, uh, electrical event, ventricles depolarize, and then, I'm sorry, let me start, let me say that over. Electrical event, atria depolarize, physical event, atria contract. Electrical event, ventricles depolarize, physical event, ventricles contract, and then the ventricles repolarize. And so it continues as such over and over. And then there's two different intervals um, that we look at from time to time. The PR interval is the period from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS reflection here, deflection I mean. Um, this represents atrial depolarization to the beginning of ventricular depolarization. So essentially what that is, is that the time required to transmit an action potential through the entire conduction system. 
so from the SA node down to the ventricles. And then the QT interval is the period from the beginning of the QRS uh, deflection to the end of the T wave, representing ventricular depolarization to repolarization. So this part's going to be dependent on your heart rate. The QT interval is going to change depending on your heart rate. When you hear the term cardiac cycle, it's basically all of the changes in the heart from the initiation of one heartbeat to the start of the next. You've got the term systole, which refers to the con contraction of a heart chamber, and diastole refers to the relaxation. So when the, the ventricle contracts, it's called ventricular systole. When the ventricle relaxes, it's called ventricular diastole. You've got pressure changes that happen throughout the cardiac cycle, um, from the alternating contraction and relaxation of the different chambers, and that's responsible for the unidirectional flow and the closing of the valves. So when it contracts, it's going to push the blood into the next chamber, and then that kind of, it allows for pressure changes to happen, and as those pressure changes happen, it allows for the opening and closing of the valves, all so that the blood can move in the proper direction and not flow back. Factors that influence heart rate, positive chronotropic agents are things that make the heart rate go faster. Your sympathetic neurons, these increase the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's your body's adrenaline. It comes from the adrenal medulla. Epinephrine and norepinephrine increase calcium entry into the nodal cells, which make them reach their threshold faster so that you're going to have a faster heart rate. Nicotine stimulates norepinephrine release from neurons, so it's going to work the same way. It's just another source of um, stimulation for norepinephrine release, and then cocaine inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine, which can lead to fast erratic heart rate. So norepinephrine is one of those that it's going to come out, it's going to do its job, and it's going to go away pretty quickly. Um, cocaine prevents it from going away pretty quickly, so it's going to stick around, and that can mess with your heart rate and rhythm. Negative chronotropic agents are things that decrease the heart rate. You've got parasympathetic neurons, so rest and digest. These, these guys release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to voltage-gated potassium channels, causing hyperpolarization. So hyperpolarization means that, remember how whenever we're repolarizing, so whenever we're moving back to resting membrane potential, that's a result of calcium leaving the cell. If, cal if we reach that me resting membrane potential and potassium continues to leave the cell, now we've gone below resting membrane potential. So instead of negative 60, we might be at negative 70. That's called hyperpolarization. And what that does is that when the next time we go to make an action potential, we have even further to go before we reach that threshold. So hyperpolarization makes it harder to reach threshold. So it's gonna make it take a longer time, which means our heart rate, our heartbeats are gonna be more spread out. Beta blocking drugs prevent epinephrine and norepinephrine from binding to the receptors in the heart, and so it slows the heart rate down. So you still have the adrenaline molecules in your body, but they cannot activate their receptors in the heart, so the heart is it's kind of like the heart just doesn't see it, so they don't respond to it for beta blocker drugs.